Welcome back to New Rockstars. I'm Jessica Clemens, and this is a breakdown of 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong. This is our MonsterVerse rewatch series, and every week we're gonna go, go, Godzilla! I like that one from last week, so I'm gonna stick to it. Into Hollow Earth for our MonsterVerse rewatch series and breaking down each of the MonsterVerse films plus Monarch Legacy of Monsters. We've finally made it, our final rewatch. We've watched Godzilla, Monarch's TV show, Skull Island, King of the Monsters, and we finally made it to Godzilla vs. Kong. We finally made it to our babies fighting. This movie solidified a lot of Monarch and Hollow Earth, which we know comes into play a lot for Godzilla x Kong, so let's just jump into it. But first, be sure to check out nerdride.shop to check out our latest and greatest in new Rockstars merch. Right now, you can grab our multiverse tour shirt inspired by Deadpool or the Face Off shirt featuring both of our favorite heroes. Grabbing some merch from the nerdride.shop is the best way to support the channel and all the work that we do here at New Rockstars. I also think that we have our Xavier Institute t-shirt. I think we're getting break room merch, so go, go check it out. It's gonna be hot. And it's also summer, so you need a crop top. Show that little tummy. Okay. Now we're getting into it. We opened the movie with the studio logos as we did last time. These logos were created by Yuko. They also did the main titles and Apex's commercial that we see later. The treatment that was requested to make the studio logos was to combine a craggy, ancient hewn stone to hollow earth with the vibrant, crackling energy source that is found there. So this is a common stone found in hollow earth. The wall is actually featured in Kong Skull Island inside the Wanderer ship where they reveal Kong's history. This crackling energy is supposed to be the energy found there, but it's similar to something you'd see in like a synth wave aesthetic, which Adam Wing the director is a huge fan of. My name is the plague. So I think we're referring to the glimmers that we see through the cracks in the wall, like Godzilla's skin when powering up the atomic blast. We see that energy later in the movie when Kong places Godzilla's axe around the throne. You can hear the sounds of nature and the faint sounds of a helicopter, which could remind us of Skull Island. This wall also has hieroglyphs of men with weapons and old symbols, similar to the Iwi people's markings. This is said to remind us of the last time we saw Kong, which was in Skull Island and his connection to Skull Island and the Iwi tribe. Then in juxtaposition, we get the legendary studio logo. Blue, coal, more like basalt, which can be found down on the ocean floor. Also, the way the light shifts emphasizes that we're underwater like in King of the Monsters. These hieroglyphs don't look like the same ones from Godzilla King of the Monsters. Those were carved in. These look painted. We cut to black at the same time you hear a single beat of Kong hitting his chest. We're somewhere on Skull Island and we open on the silhouette of the sun and the sounds of nature and these birds. The last time we saw these birds silhouetted by the sun, they were killing that scientist in Skull Island and it's almost identical shots. Different time of day, but you know, still the crazy birds. Kong awakens from his slumber on the side of a mountain over the mountain across the sea by Bobby Vinton plays. This song not only in title parallels with what Kong is currently doing, but was released in 1963. And I feel like Kong Skull Island left us with that like 50, 60, 70 vibe because we span over those decades in the movie. So it's still serving that here for Kong. Yet, like an old man, he goes about his day. Noah also mentioned some folks online pointing out that this opening has a lot of Shrek vibes to it. Shrek, he's waking up, scratching his butt and stretching. I can see Adam using that as a reference. The last time we saw Kong was in 1973 during the events of Skull Island. This movie takes place in present day 2021, so he was much smaller then. As for the timeline overall, Skull Island takes place in 73, Godzilla takes place in 2014, King of the Monsters takes place in 2019, and Godzilla vs. Kong takes place in 2021. So it's only a little under three years since the last huge Titan attack that awoke a ton of Titans. So rightfully, we should expect to see the world still recovering, more plans in place for these sort of things, and new discoveries around the Titans and what they want. This could be the same spot where Kong left Weaver and Conrad at the end of Skull Island's movie. I'm not too sure, they just look very similar. To the right, you see the little deer we also saw on Skull Island. He watched himself under a waterfall to wake himself up and he's really just like us. Then we meet Gia, played by Kaylee Hoddle. This actress and the character are both deaf, but Gia is able to speak with Kong via sign language and later we learn can sense Titans. Gia is 10 years old and an orphan Iwi native. We learn later between Andrews and Nathan that a storm wiped out the Iwi people in their village, which we didn't see in the movies. In the novelization, they spoke about how Gia was left in her last moments of survival and was rescued by Kong. The Kingdom Kong graphic novel shows how Monarch helped evacuate some of the Iwi people during the storm. We don't know where they took them though, and we do know that Brooks was running it, then put Eileen Andrews in charge, so there's a lot of confusion around like which one's canon. In the 2014 Godzilla breakdown, I mentioned how some of the books get tricky because there can be inconsistencies when making them canon. I always refer to them as soft canon overall because it seems like so long as it doesn't contradict the movie, it is canon. Though Kingdom Kong, where Monarch helped evacuate Iwi people, 
is considered to be canon. But I don't think that's helpful because then we're left asking, okay, is Eileen just lying about knowing that there's other Ewees? Did Brooks just never tell her? It doesn't contradict the story, but it does raise other questions. Regardless, going off what we know from the movie, it is confirmed that Gia is an orphan, a storm wiped out the Ewee people, and as far as Eileen knows, Gia is the last of them. You can see the design of the rocks Gia is sitting under that resembles the infrastructure for Skull Island's Ewee village entrance. It's just missing some of the Ewee design. She's holding and adding extra pieces to her Kong doll. Kong did this tree stripping move in Skull Island when he beat the Alpha Scroll Crawler's ass, because when Kong picks a switch, he goes big, because he's a big boy. Gia is running through the forest and we see what looks like a camera in the tree. This shows that we're monitoring Skull Island. In the director's commentary, Adam Wingert said that this is just a piece of the heave ship that they put in the tree. When Gia offers Kong her doll, we zoom in on her ear and we hear nothing. We don't know she's deaf yet, so this is supposed to highlight that, but I also feel like what would be horrifying to us to see with the added noise of a 300 foot plus gorilla crushing massive trees, shaking the ground and heavy breathing in our face isn't scary to Gia at all. They clearly have a relationship because remember the Iwi people formed a bond with Kongs and worshiped them. And also he protects her since they're the last of Skull Island. They're essentially just family. Richard Bennett, the storyboard artist for the movie, also released this awesome book on the storyboard art for the film. He came up with the shot of throwing the tree staff with inspiration from the Apollo launch, just how it zooms like a javelin, but then makes contact with the dome. The dome's honeycomb crystals sprinkled down, revealing a bunch of reinforced metal. Like Godzilla King of the Monsters intro, we didn't know Emma and Maddie were in China at all because they disguised their home to be so American. Here we didn't know Kong was being monitored within a biodome. This is Kong's containment monarch outpost 236 on Skull Island. In King of the Monsters, it says Kong is on Skull Island Outpost 33. This could be a separate outpost or Outpost 236 could have replaced Outpost 33 post-storm. It just wasn't confirmed in the movie. So a lot of records online will mark Skull Island with two outposts, 33 and 236. You see the horrible storm that's still happening. So clearly Monarch was able to create some sort of protection without fully leaving the island. Inside, we see that the biodome's roof is being alerted. They call that section of the roof Sector 7G, which is a Simpsons reference. It's where Homer works in the power plant. On the ground, we see Dr. Eileen Andrews played by Rebecca Hall, a scientist of Monarch and adoptive mother to Gia. They discuss how they need to keep Kong on Skull Island, but he's getting too big for the biodome. If released, he can't stay on Skull Island because of that storm, but if he tried to leave, Godzilla would fight him since they're both Alpha Titans. Eileen also discloses in Iwi mythology, they've had recorded rivalry. In the Godzilla Dominion book by Greg Keyes, Godzilla remembers a time when his rival drove him out, his rival being Kong. Though Greg mentioned in Dominion how he saw it as a Kong or several Kongs pushed Godzilla out when he was young. The title sequence introduces us to the movie by showing the history of the Titans and Hollow Earth and the rivalry between Godzilla and Kong. It uses a lot of science research and documents to back it up. It also recaps Godzilla and Kong with other Titans and features tidbits from the past movies. We see Godzilla and Kong fighting in an old painting. It looks like a Mayan design. Also important to note that Kong is holding an ax here, which we later see in the movie, and Kong's had a bounty of ax-like weapons with Godzilla's spike at the end of it. I also just like how this footage is like really grainy, like it's been taken on an old camcorder, like an 80s one. The redacted says, as decades of research into ancient stories leads to a legendary pictures production. This emphasizes how this is all a video with documented research, sort of like a documentary, but also not at all like a documentary. This cuneiform writing, this is the oldest written language system. This tablet shown here is a real one similar to this. Another shot establishing just how much research has been done and how far back the Titans go. The translation says giants battle underground, again, highlighting just how long this has been going on for. We spoke about it earlier, but Adam Winger, the director's redacted credits say the history of the Titan War will be explored in a film by Adam Winger that sheds light on the previously hidden truths. So this film will talk about the Titan Wars or more so the beef between Godzilla and Kongs. And if we don't get that much into it or get enough information, I assume there's still room to explore it in Godzilla X Kong, seeing as the credits say it will be explored in a film by Adam Winger. It doesn't necessarily say which film, so... Godzilla X Kong, I think I know what you're talking about. Cave paintings of Godzilla and Kong's fighting. This resembles some of the earliest cave paintings found in France and Spain. Also, I think there's a scroll crawler in the bottom left and Mothra at the top. The overlapping words say subterranean world. This is most likely a depiction of the Great Titan War. In the trailer, we knew they talk about this. Ages ago, there was a fight, but we see that the fight here has all the creatures in Hollow Earth. A censored man giving a speech and the words say Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump was an American Navy expedition in the Arctic. It involved 4,700 men, 70 ships, and 30 33 aircrafts and had the goal of scientific research and establishing research bases. However, it's been subject to conspiracy theories because 
Why would you need 4,700 men and 70 ships to research the Arctic? We see satellite imagery of a hole in the Arctic. Clearly we're made to believe it was them searching for an entrance to hollow earth, which we see later. Then we see scientists discredited. This is probably referring to Nathan who implied he was fired from Monarch for his theories. The redacted credits mentioned earlier how Alexander Skarsgård's character needs to prove existence of hollow earth to salvage his tarnished reputation. The redacted mentions countless explorers have attempted to prove the connection, Eliza Gonzalez, and many have perished. She plays Maya, Walter Simmons' daughter later in the movie, who, spoilers, does perish. And I guess her death will be tied to countless explorers, but she was actually kind of just a snake. We get their stats in this intro as well. Titan-class Godzilla, Titanus Gojira, lifespan unknown, height 393 feet, goddamn, weight 164,000 tons, blood volume 530,000 gallons, walking speed 18 miles per hour, which seems a little too slow for me. You get the gist. We're going through their stats now in the intro, and I really like this. You see Godzilla's kiss of death from the first movie that we love seeing so much. Then we lock on death and note Titanus Muto, female, status deceased, cause of death, internal combustion, kiss of death defeated. Titanus Kong, height 104, which was his height in Skull Island. In this movie, he's the tallest he's been so far at 335 feet. Weight is 158 tons, which I assume was also the Skull Island weight. Adam has noticed the errors in the title sequence, especially referring to this part, which are extremely minor. But this movie went through so much because it was a pandemic film, so some stuff slipped through the cracks. The origin is Skull Island, opposable thumb, capable of using tools, weapons, and exceptional skill. Intelligence is highly adaptable and resourceful. His strength is immensely powerful. Durability tough and resilient, great receptive powers. His weakness is that he's susceptible to flammable attacks, which we saw on Skull Island. Also, I just think it's funny here how Godzilla's info was all super precise and scientific and Kong was just like, my boy's strong as hell, don't worry about it. This could also just be because humans and Monarch, I spent more time witnessing Godzilla rather than Kong, but I just think, it's just funny overall. We see Titanius Cranium Reptant, aka the Alpha Skull Crawler. Status deceased, cause of death, disembowelment. Height 95 feet and weight was 100 tons defeated. Ghidorah, the devil with three heads, super species profile, classification Titanus Ghidorah, nature unknown, body height 521 feet. The weight says 121 with two zero tons. I think they just left off a zero here. Like a March Madness bracket, they show how many times Godzilla has defeated a Titan. We see Kong's winning bracket. Now it's time for Kong versus Godzilla. And I love this depiction for the two because this sequence can give insight to the ancient war that they've been fighting for dominance all this time. It's the last man standing now. It's Godzilla and Kong. We close with a main title, blue for Godzilla and yellow for Kong. We begin in the darkness, a man welcoming us to his podcast. It's the TTP Titan Truth Podcast. This is Bernie Hayes, by Brian Tyree Henry's Titan Conspiracy Podcast. He's been doing this for five years, so two years before Ghidorah awoke. Apex Corporation was last mentioned in Monarch Legacy of Monsters as AET, Applied Experimental Technologies. It's a place where May found out AET had been experimenting on animals and wiped all their data. The CEO, Walter Simmons, later in talks with Verdugo, mentioned a new deal with Monarch and later called themselves Apex Cybernetics. Apex Cybernetics is in Pensacola, Florida, as we can see, and it's good to note here that throughout the movies, anytime we're on a coastline, God Godzilla will be coming. Honestly, after all these attacks, you'd think you'd be like, you know what, I'm moving to middle America because I can't be next to an ocean. We get an Apex Cybernetics commercial video beginning with a bright Apex logo, pulling out to be in the center of a pupil, which is important and you'll see in a moment, exploding into the creation of the universe. Also, this entire sequence is reused Nat geo -ass imagery, which I'm truly not kidding. Here's a depiction from their video on the creation of the universe that looks very similar. Then we see a child's eye wide and curious to a camera refocusing like a pupil. All the text on the side mentions Apex Cybernetics and cornea erect, which would mean it's depicting an eyeball, which makes sense from the eyeball footage that we saw prior. We see what it could be later when Bernie is hacking the computers. Then we see the full-on eyeball of Mega Godzilla when Bernie's investigating. Stock footage of robotic arms caring for plants, glitching into the program microchip, showing how everything in our mind can be whittled down to a fine piece of tech. Someone's brain is being monitored like an EEG and their brain waves and patterns are being monitored on the screen. Robots playing chess and in the back you can see the human brain being monitored again, showing the computer sentience is being applied through human diagnostics. Human hands touch a robot's claw like we're merging. People running in an open field and children wave as their faces are being scanned and targeted. All these depictions foreshadow the movie. Essentially, it shows how Mechagodzilla will be our new protector, our weapons for humans, which is why we have so much AI and human imagery, like our lives depend on each other. How we use Ren to sync with Mechagodzilla is that human and robot dependency we're seeing in this commercial. Then we're introduced to Apex Cybernetics, Walter Simmons, and he says he's proud to lead Apex into a bold new era. They're not going anywhere, and neither are you. Say it with me, kids, assimilation. Walter was the CEO of Apex before they changed their name. 
though we never saw him in Monarch Legacy of Monsters. So this was a long time coming. Walter is played by Demian Bashir. I also like that Walter signed his name like an 80s villain with highlight of pink. It's just a nice touch. Inside Apex, we see where they're keeping their liquid nitrogen because we know they're keeping things like robots and Titans heads from overheating and decaying. This is also a sewage plant in Hawaii. And just like how they shot Jinjira in the 2014 Godzilla, these locations are just great for nuclear plants. After annoying Horus into leaving, Bernie gets access to his computer. He offers Horus hand sanitizer I made from my own garden, which is a funny thing because this is a pandemic film and we kind of like sold out of hand sanitizer during the time. So people were just like reduced to naturally making their own. So I don't think it's a callback, but it, 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 it's kind of funny for the time. While accessing their files, the paperwork Horus was working on covers Apex Clinical Physiology. These records are from June 2010 and given to one Michael Holy, who was the graphic designer for the movie. Godzilla approaches Pensacola with zero respect, blasting his atomic breath and scaring the crap out of everyone. Again, it's been three years since people have seen a, like a Titan sighting, so this is very terrifying. This footage of people running is actually repurposed footage that actually had Millie Bobby Brown's Maddie in it. They edited it out here and just used it at the beginning. It's talked about later, but Godzilla only attacks when there's a threat, and that threat was Ghidorah's DNA. Ghidorah's DNA is still used in creating Mecha Godzilla, so I assume any time it's being used, essentially Godzilla is sensing it and coming to fight the other Alpha. Though here, it's just Mecha Godzilla's iris. Godzilla blows up the sub level, and you can see Mecha Godzilla's eyeball and in the distance you see Godzilla standing there menacingly. Godzilla starts destroying Apex, then we cut to CNN breaking news. And throughout the movies, we haven't really seen real life news reports like CNN. While we send out our naval aircraft the following morning to the scene of the crime, the news highlights Godzilla no longer Titan Savior, which they go back and forth on a lot. He's a giant monster. What do you want from him? Additionally, this Godzilla on screen as news footage is actually an unfinished VFX shot that was at the beginning of the movie. The editor filmed it on his phone on the monitor and just starts shaking his camera around and it worked for the film. So they put it in here. We're taking into Maddie's classroom. She's now living in Pensacola. This is her Pensacola high school. Last film, her mom sacrificed herself and now she's living here with her dad in Florida and still thinking about those Titans. Outside the classroom schools, we now have posters on staying safe because Titans are everywhere. Just compared to the other movies that we've seen already, you see how we're progressing in like a kaiju world. Where they're watching the news of Godzilla's attack, it mentions below that there are temporary relief shelters on the coast, which we'll see later. On the left of the TV, you see a poster of natural resources and non-renewable resources. Both posters reflect the Titans and how they can suspend our natural resources and restore nature's balance. As for non-renewable resources like nuclear energy, they retain that. I might be a looney tune, but in the back of the classroom, you can see a silhouette of Godzilla and another animal on the right poster with the same silhouette of the sun. This brings me back to Kong Skull Island sun silhouette that was inspired by Neon Genesis. Walter Simmons is then questioned by the destruction of Apex and reveals that what happened is a threat to humanity and Apex has been working on dealing with it once and for all, AKA they're trying to kill Godzilla. School's not out, but Maddie's leaving, listening to Bernie's podcast. We can see the Titan Truth podcast art and it's a triangle and what I think is Godzilla's eye. It's kind of similar to the 1998 Godzilla poster. It's also very similar to the Illuminati symbol because you know, you get it, he's a conspiracy theorist. There are a lot of reshoots and pickup shots that happen later in this movie. So you can see some inconsistencies in wardrobe at times. And it's not at all distracting. I just noticed it like here where Maddie's phone has a giant three and some shapes. Then we cut to the podcast back to her walking and the stickers are all different on the phone. It's actually just not the same phone at all. Also, Noah noted who the hell looks at a screen of their phone while playing and listening to a podcast. That's just weird. At the Monarch Relief Camp, Pensacola, Florida, this is one of the temporary relief shelters the news mentioned earlier. It looks very similar to the relief camps we saw after Godzilla's 2014 attack. In the background, you can see the smoking remnants of Apex, and we see Mark making his return from Godzilla King of the Monsters, now officially back at Monarch. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Mental health can be a hard thing to wrap your mind around. Everybody has off days, but when those days start becoming more frequent or taking more of a toll, it's time to find a therapist, which is exactly what BetterHelp can help you do. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. First, you go to their site, and you can use our link, betterhelp.com slash new rock stars. You answer a few questions, and BetterHelp will match you to a professional who has years of experience helping people with struggles just like yours. You can do it all from your phone or computer via phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel most comfortable. It's the easiest possible way to start talking to a therapist. You'll be matched to a therapist usually within 48 hours, so you can get started fast. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you all from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash new rock stars or choose new rock stars during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. Maddie references Godzilla's intimidation display, which we learned about in King of the Monsters when Godzilla menacingly flashes spikes at the G team. Back at Maddie's new home, listening to conspiracies again, her little space has a little triangular terrarium, alligator skull. I'm 99% sure that's a squirrel 
skeleton and long Q-tips. She looks like a crackpot theorist, and if we learn anything from her mom, this might be genetic. Bernie's theory is that Godzilla's attack was provoked, and Pensacola is the only coastal apex hub with an advanced robotics lab, so something in there provoked Godzilla. Then we're taken to Denham University of Theoretical Science in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is a fictional school, but also I'm pretty sure it's named after Carl Denham from the original King Kong movie. We meet Dr. Nathan Lynn, played by Alexander Skarsgård. Production referred to this as Beardgate, and I really like this. I think it's just really funny. Skarsgård was in the middle of shooting The Stand, and he needed to keep his beard. So they made it work for the movie as just a withered professor down on his luck at the beginning. You can see the art for Hollow Earth HQ with all the math all over the windows of his office when he's approached by Sarazawa. Then we see Simmons is already there looking at his book. When Simmons slams it on the table, we see Monarch Records disclosing Monarch's Topex. Topex is a satellite designed to measure ocean surface topography. Topex or Poseidon spent 13 plus years in orbit to improve their understanding of the ocean circulation and its impact on global climate. This document also references a Phil Callahan at JPL. This person is a real head of calibration team at JPL who calibrates data from the satellite. The top shows a map of California's natural resources and mines, so probably locations to Titan activity. Sarazawa sets up the state-of-the-art hologram, which of course Apex has. Adam loves holograms because he's very into Star Wars. He just, I mean, who doesn't? The hologram brings up Earth with tethers from different continents to hollow Earth. The energy readings of hollow Earth are similar to Godzilla. Like the sun to us, hollow Earth's Godzilla-like energy can sustain the entire planet. Simmons tells him that the energy force like this, they can compete with Godzilla when he attacks. So he's hiring Nathan to enter a hollow Earth to source that energy. The energy readings have 450 gigawatt per hour. A single gigawatt is typically the capacity of a nuclear plant and is enough energy to power a city. So hollow Earth is generating 441 times that amount. Nathan says this. And hollow Earth entry is impossible. I tried. So I don't think Dr. Lynn has been told everything. From Monarch, we know that Lee Shaw led an expedition to Hollow Earth, or Terra Firma, which might be between Hollow Earth and the surface, and returned in the 1980s. So Monarch knows it's definitely possible, although I do think Monarch, they made a hazy distinction between Terra Firma and the actual Hollow Earth, but it was all just like quite confusing. Also, the opening credits listed Hollow Earth expeditions in 1926, though it's possible it wasn't successful. So maybe Monarch hasn't been all true to Hollow Earth, maybe only Terra Firma. Nathan's brother died on a journey to Hollow Earth, when the team was crushed in a gravitational inversion, killing them instantly. So Apex is offering a new aircraft that can sustain that inversion. And it's the Heave, the Hollow Earth aerial vehicle that we're so used to now. Nathan plans on approaching Eileen to release Kong so he can lead them into Hollow Earth. Back in the dome, Godzilla wanders and you can still see the dome is being damaged. There's new holes too, so Kong is truly pissed. In Gia's room, we see all of her art, some of Godzilla. Adam Winger drew all of this art. Cause you can never get the art department to do actual like childlike art that'll always be just too good. So Adam sat to the side with crayons and just drew them. We're interrupted by Nathan and Andrews tells him that their meddling already ruined Kong's natural habitat. And I think she's just taking responsibility for Monarch letting King Ghidorah escape. Ghidorah's storm is really what led the destruction of Skull Island's atmosphere, but prior to his escape, he was being kept under Monarch supervision. We learn through Nathan's plea that there's an entrance to Hollow Earth through Antarctica. This was revealed through the Apex satellite that found those tethers I mentioned earlier. So now we're transporting Kong from the dome on Skull Island and the song currently playing is Loving Arms by Elvis Presley. Adam Winger is a big Elvis fan and he said lyrically and in tone he saw Kong as old as Elvis and you know I kind of see it. When Kong places his hand in the water touching the sea you can see all the scars left from the helicopter from Skull Island. Kong being chained to a boat and transported also isn't new to us. They used chloroform back in the day but here we're using sedatives injected through his collar. We're introduced to Walter Simmons daughter Maya who I mentioned earlier who runs point for Apex. Gia we think is hearing Godzilla's heartbeat increase right here and it's because he's in distress. He doesn't want to be doing all this. He doesn't trust anyone on that ship. Back with Maddie we see she's trying to figure out who does the Titan Truth podcast. And on her wall, we see the first Godzilla attack in Pensacola, Florida. When we zoom out, we see Godzilla attack three near Libya and Chad, Apex number two near Egypt and Sudan, Apex facility number six attacked around Morocco. There was another attack off the coast of French Guiana in Brazil. Notes on Emma Russell, Maddie's mom from King of the Monsters who awoke all the Titans via Ghidorah on a mission to rid most of the humans on Earth and rebalance nature with the Titans. When researching more of the Titan podcast, we see that number 244 is Mothra pregnancy theory. So who's the baby daddy? And I think Mothra reproduces asexually. It's never really explained in the MonsterVerse yet. And I also think they're probably just, you know, saying that it's Godzilla here. Episode 243, Avoiding Apex Trackers, the ins and outs of avoiding Big Brother. As we see, they literally track everything by satellite. In the description, it talks about how he sets off metal detectors whenever he goes to the airport ever since he started working for Apex. This is because they install surveillance trackers in their employees as well. Apparently, he found a workaround for this, which is showering and bleach. Episode 242, Godzilla missing. Just because we can't see him doesn't mean he can't see us. 246, Godzilla is not the enemy. It's called collateral damage, people. And 245 is Godzilla's sudden attack. Nobody puts Godzilla 
in a corner. Those were the two that we heard earlier. We're introduced to Maddie's friend, Josh, played by Julian Dennison, who just like her is into this stuff. He's driving his brother's van called Storm Truck. And from all that stuff on it, it looks like it does track weather patterns. It resembles all the vans and trucks they used in Twister. Also, it's a couple of teenagers chasing a monster in a green and yellow van. Is, is this a Scooby-Doo reference? I feel like it is. We move to the cafe to discuss. It's Maddie, Josh, and Bernie. Adam, if you haven't noticed, is a huge sci-fi movie and 80s synth wave fan. He loves the neon cafe look. He also just did Death Note where that was a blue one. So here we have a red one. He also mentioned this is where the movie turns into a real sci-fi. So they took that direction in color tone as well. Bernie is drinking Kazunara whiskey, which is the actor who first wore the Mecha Godzilla suit. We're at the Tasman Sea, still traveling with Kong. Kong literally picks up a ton of fish and eats it with a smile. They added this little part of him smiling to make it fun for the kids watching because he knew this movie is for the kids at the end of the day and you want to bring some joy to this forced relocation. Later, after revealing to Nathan Gia's origins and Kong, he requests Gia to keep the reins on him, to which Andrew says this. Yeah, no one can keep the reins on Kong. Every time Kong is put in chains, that gorilla rips out of them so truly nothing can keep him down. Gia senses Godzilla is here and everyone's panicking. Rebecca has her hand on Kaylee Hoddle, Gia's back, during this scene because she can't hear the action but needs to know the action to shake and balance with the ship with Godzilla pounding. So Rebecca tapped her on the back a few times to signal like action. I just thought that was nice to hear in the director commentary. Kong has a negative reaction to the cannon fire, which makes sense because his only other interaction with guns that we know of was on Skull Island where they used it against him. Godzilla tail whips this fighter pilot, then slams his massive tail through the ships like the Kraken. When Godzilla approaches the boat and swims under it, it is directly a connection to Jaws. He did this in the first Godzilla movie as well. Godzilla and Kong begin to fight underwater, which is harder for Kong than it is for Godzilla because this is his turf. He's used to water. Plus Kong has been taking sedatives for the last day or so. Something I really do like is that Adam knows that Kong is like a big human, whereas Godzilla is a cat. Nathan rises from the waters on the ship at the same time Kong rises from underwater back onto the ship. This was done as a reflection of Kong and humans being similar. The pilot's helmet says Hirota, which is a reference to Brian Hirota, who worked on the VFX for the film. This scene of Godzilla jumping onto the ship was the first VFX shot they worked on. This shot is so insane, and I spent so long trying to understand it. Godzilla is hit by missiles, and the pilot's ship explodes on his spikes, and we follow that debris into the ocean onto Godzilla. In the director's commentary, Adam mentioned the DP believes every shot should have a purpose, and this purpose felt like we're flaunting this dance between Kong and Godzilla, how everything feels choreographed and plan, even though it's sporadic, it's still very fluid. Godzilla prepares his atomic blast and Kong jumps off the boat John McClane style, which was the inspiration for this scene. Godzilla drags Kong nearly to the bottom of the ocean. Luckily, the missiles they set off save him and our boy's tired. He's done so. He was fighting in that water, literally drowning, though Godzilla's coming back for more. And while Kong is out, they're pretending to be dead because Godzilla is an animal. And if he thinks he's dead, he'll just leave. Bernie, Maddie, and Josh run back to Apex Cybernetics to see what was on sub-level 33. Upon returning, they find out the eye is gone. And sub level 33, they find a bunch of eggs filled with skull crawlers, the creatures we saw back in Skull Island. We also hear Maglev shuttle departure to Roswell, New Mexico at 0900 hours. Roswell is, of course, the location of Roswell's incident where a crashing U.S. Army balloon birthed a million conspiracy theories about UFOs, alien invasions, and government cover ups. Its inclusion here hints at some apex activity involved in the Roswell incident. Every time we see an apex screen like this, it displays that red text at the top that reads Apex Power Search, copyright Apex Cybernetics. All rights reserved. Apex is so corporate. They put their copyright on their own internal security system and display it on their screen. Ugh, I hate Walter Simmons. The kids and Bernie travel in a pod from Florida to Hong Kong via underground Apex tunnels. That's like halfway around the world and maybe a couple hours or maybe even minutes. We're flying Kong to Antarctica where the Hollow Earth launch station is. In the older Godzilla vs. Kong, Kong was airlifted by balloons. So this is sort of an homage to that. Adam didn't want to do it because it seemed too silly, but you know, like how else were they going to get Kong to Antarctica if not by ship? So in Antarctica, we had Monarch Outpost 32, which we saw in King of the Monsters where Ghidorah was hidden. And now we also have a Hollow Earth entrance. Kong heads into Hollow Earth and they immediately get in the super sci-fi heave ship. For the design of the heaves, Adam wanted them to feel like Akira. They're anti-gravity with weird emissions. So that felt like the motorcycles from the movie. They start falling into the vortex and this is where Nathan's brother died. The screen goes black and they pop on the other side. In Adam's movie Pop Skull, the main character ODs on Robitussin and he has this like trip out sequence that inspired this scene. We also see them go through this again in the Godzilla X Kong trailer. Hollow Earth is both upside down and right side up. When we fell through Hollow Earth, we fell through its ceiling going down. But when gravity captured them and bounced the heave ship back up, they went back to the ceiling. On the fall down though, they pass Kong who grabs onto the mountains. When they reverse their gravitational propulsions, the camera shifts and turns them back right side up. So they're essentially on the ceiling. Theoretically, the reason gravity is so weird here is because gravity is generated by mass. In reality, the densest part of Earth is at its core. But if the Earth has 
no core and is instead hollow, the gravity would be generated by the shell of the Earth. This might explain why after falling out of the tunnel, they fall back towards the ceiling as gravity is now pulling them in the direction of the shell they just fell through. At first, Hollow Earth was a dark, moody place, but Adam didn't have a lot of experience with CGI. Ultimately, they realized it had to be a fantasy world for Kong, his real home where he thrived. So Hollow Earth has different terrains. It's more than just a jungle. In the distance is a single light source that sort of looks like the sun, which of course wouldn't make sense. Tim Hammock, production designer for the film, stated in an art book for the film that Hollow Earth is lit by a pulsating storm. And I think you see that light source storm here later. The first encounter is with the war bats that Kong starts messing up. Kong starts giving out the old Hulk versus Loki smash. And after winning, he eats from the severed head of the war bat. Kong gets tied up again, which my boy is always being restrained. In Skull Island, I think he gets wrapped up or tied up three separate times by the Meyer squid, chain, skull crawlers. Like this isn't new for him, but give my boy a break. Tom Woodruff made these little creatures. They're called the Rock Claws based on the demon seed, the little things that came out of the ground. I think we saw an offshoot of these little guys called Mantle Claws in the first episode of Monarch. The Rock Claws is then eaten by Doug. This creature does not have a name, but has been memed as Doug, and Adam loved it and vowed if he ever does another MonsterVerse movie, he'll find a way to put Doug in it. Kong is curious about gravity and jumps beginning to float, lifting himself from the rocks. This feels like the painting of like the creation of Adam. When you're basically standing on the ceiling and you're in between gravity, yeah, you can launch yourself up and have fun in this world. Back with Bernie, Maddie, and Josh, we make it to Apex Hong Kong. Maddie looks down at an eyeball on the ground and we see claw marks on the wall. The speaker announces a demonstration is about to happen. In the control room, we see this 80s villain, Walter Simmons, moving across the deck floor. In the background, we see the sick ass synth wavy charm looking diagram of Godzilla. Out of the ground with so much fog, we bring up Mecha Godzilla. We first saw Mecha Godzilla and Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla in 1973. We haven't seen the outside yet, but Ren is currently operating Mecha Godzilla with within Ghidorah's skull that we last saw in King of the Monsters post credit scene. In Godzilla against Mega Godzilla, that Mega Godzilla was built around the bones of Godzilla, and then Godzilla's roar made it go crazy. And this is similar to what we're gonna see in the movie. Once engaged with Sarazawa, Mega Godzilla is up and running. They release a red skull crawler, and in Skull Island, these were the biggest threats, but in this movie, they're made to be a punk. The ease in which Mega Godzilla tears it apart with its atomic blast, it's it, it, it's a perfect reference to just how strong Mega Godzilla is. Maddie keeps her shit together because she's better than the other two guys here. She's been close up and personal with Titans before. We switch back to Mark, whom we haven't seen since the beginning. That's an actual phone shot in this movie. You can tell with the frame rates, it's kind of weird on it. Zach Fox, labeled in the phone, was one of the VFX editors. In the director's commentary, Adam flags this as Vasquez Rocks, so they must have added this in like CGI. Vasquez Rocks is where Star Trek was shot, Jane Silent Bob, Austin Powers, a lot of things shoot here, but more sci-fi things. This is an homage to the 2001 Space Odyssey, the monolith scene. This is like that in Kongs are like the apes. It's just a little homage, but I also don't think it's completely tailored to that movie scene because these are just, you know, monkeys and stones. Kong finds a red painted hand mark. We saw one of these in Skull Island too. It seems to be a common way for Kong people to mark their territory. Kong's temple is based on the Gotianum by Rudolf Steiner. Kong pulls his ax out of the head of a skeleton. Apparently in the novelization, it was said to be a skull of an offshoot of a Gojira species. The ax end is equipped with Godzilla's spike. Originally in the script, it was supposed to be a scepter. They made it an ax that can absorb Godzilla's energy. In the director's commentary, Adam gets into this being the grounds where Godzilla lived and Kong's made weapons to fight Godzilla with his spikes, which is true Truly the only way they could win. The pillars around the throne are inlaid with glowing material. It looks very similar to the glowing floating rocks that we saw a little bit earlier. Since those rocks had strange gravitational properties, I wonder if these pillars are actually some sort of gravity machine. Maybe it can open a vortex to the surface. This is a Noah Chen theory and I stand by it. We get the king on his throne and it's honestly a beautiful shot. Back with the Scooby-Doo gang, Bernie says, Lizard people built all their facilities the same way. I can find the exit. There is an actual conspiracy theory about humanoid reptiles that can take the shape of humans and secretly control the world by taking the place of the world leaders. And given who Bernie is, he's probably a lizard people thinker, you know, cause he's a conspiracy theorist. But I guess he could be referencing the fact that Apex studies Godzilla, who is lizard-like, and the facility's layout might be very similar to the one that he worked at. They made a real skeleton head for this scene. The lighting is also live on set. So Ghidorah's skull is basically a living supercomputer. Godzilla is pissed and he's enacting his intimidation display again. He's headed for Hong Kong, running right through this junk ship, and that is what the boat is called. It is not me calling it a junk ship. At this point, Godzilla's just smashing through bridges on purpose. 
this. He didn't need to rise up from the ocean underneath the bridge like that. This is Hong Kong, and the last time we had Godzilla here was in Godzilla vs. the Destroyer in 1995, where we met Burning Godzilla, which we saw in the last movie. This is Lance Reddick, our boy, RIP, the Monarch director. According to Adam, it was originally supposed to be a bigger role. They removed the scene, but he was supposed to be the head of Monarch named Gillerman, who was from the King Kong 76 film. Godzilla spikes spark on Kong's axe. The closer we get to the axe-shaped hole in the ground, it really illuminates. Next to our axe are different spikes for different weapons from Godzilla. Andrews notes the axe draws radiation from the ground like it's charging. Then we see Godzilla's outline illuminated in the blue around the throne. Godzilla senses that pulse and blows a hole through Earth into Hollow Earth. And the thing is, yeah, there might not be math that backs it up, yeah, it's wild as hell, but this is a fictional movie where a giant reptile that acts like a cat just blew a hole from Hong Kong into the center of Earth. So, you know, I know you guys can all suspend disbelief, just a little bit. So that's why we watch these movies. Let's just suspend disbelief for a moment. Simmons' daughter takes the sample of the energy source Apex needed. They upload the data into their little robot and Apex is able to recreate it for Mecha Godzilla. Kong's roar, I think mixed with Godzilla's blast possibly, awaken the Ashuma, who starts attacking the people and Kong. Godzilla's atomic blast finally makes it to hollow earth and they roar at one another. Back with Maddie, Josh, and Bernie, they're infiltrating Hong Kong's apex facility when they're caught immediately. Kong rises from the ground with his ax in hand and we get this classic standoff shot. And I love their different intimidation techniques. Godzilla slaps his tail down and Kong slams his ax like a gavel then pounds the ground like Donkey Kong. They start wrestling in the middle of this Tron city using the buildings to their advantage. It's honestly wrestle style and like wrestle style drop kicks. We see the King Kong versus Godzilla homage of the tree shoving it down the throat and it's actually actually very hilarious. Kong tries to break open Godzilla's jaw. This move has happened in Skull Island, 2005 King Kong. We've seen him do this before. It originally started in the 1933 King Kong film when he killed the T-Rex. Godzilla hits Kong in the back, burning his shoulder. Then Godzilla smiles and laughs. Adam mentioned the director's commentary. Godzilla's just playing with Kong. Like, this is fun to him. Imagine horrible, psychopathic cat, like my cat. The heave coming out of Hollow Earth was inspired by the Back to the Future ride at Universal. They watched videos online of that ride and captured it. Kong grabs the top of the building using it like a shield that imbues his spiked axe with Godzilla's atomic blast, reversing the energy and spitting it back at Godzilla, knocking him out, winning round two. Bernie, Josh, and Maddie meet Simmons, who doesn't apologize for what he's creating. Then back to the Titan fight. Kong fights like a wrestler, jumping off the tightrope and landing on his opponent. Kong posted up on top of that building reminds me of the iconic King Kong Empire State building shot. It even has planes or like helicopters swinging by. Godzilla tosses Kong and then starts crawling. He's so upset and so furious about losing. He's messing Kong up. Then we get this like face-to-face -face roar between the two that's like, submit! But neither of them will. Kong tries to stand but can't. And in the director's commentary, Adam mentions that he knew Godzilla had to win since he was a child. Like Godzilla just had to win. They power up Mechagodzilla with Godzilla's energy. The system is unstable and Mechagodzilla is purely sentient and very dangerous. He sneaks up behind Simmons and murks him. The electricity, Shocking Ren, is also inspired by the Big Trouble Little China electrocution scene. After killing Simmons, Bernie says this. <laughs> it's unfair. <laughs> I really want to hear the rest of that speech. It's now daytime and Mecha Godzilla is leaving Apex burrowing a freedom hole with his freshly energized atomic blast. They call it his A-74 proton screen cannon, which most likely is a reference to 1974, the release year of the original Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla. The two charge at one another and Mecha Godzilla uses missile launchers. They're mounted on his shoulders and in his chest. He can also charge his punches and combine them with jet boosters, as we see here. Godzilla's getting his ass kicked because he's gone like three rounds. He's tired. Gia through the ground sends his Kong's heartbeat and it's slowing down because our boy is dying. Adam felt like it would have been too cliche to shoot their beams at one another, but then it turned out cool as hell. This has also been done with Mega Godzilla in the 1974 movie as well when their beams clash. Nathan uses the heave ship to basically jolt Kong's heartbeat. Kong Lethal Weapon 2 pops his arm back into place before getting back into the brawl. Ugh, I don't like that scene. Mechagodzilla is just dragging my boy across the ground through the buildings. This is disrespectful and Kong, I need you to get your ass in the game. Mechagodzilla is about to rip Godzilla's mouth open, shooting his blast through Godzilla's throat like Godzilla did to the Muto in the 2014 film. Instead, he gets humiliated in a tag team. Mechagodzilla uses his tail drill and is stopped by Kong with his ax, then he pulls the tail drill on Kong. Luckily, Josh buys them sometimes, spilling that whiskey all over the keyboard. Godzilla 
powers up Kong's axe. Then Kong starts to hack at Mega Godzilla. And honestly, this might be the most gory scene in the movie. And it's just oil. This was inspired by Sandru, how the man gets slashed and shoots blood everywhere. They did that here. Kong has ripped off at least two heads in this movie and our boy is tired. Godzilla roars and Kong stands up and roars back. Is it another round? There's no threat here. And Godzilla retreats back into the ocean. We're back in hollow earth and Nathan is dressed up like back to the future for some reason, like Marty McFly. And that's it for the revisit, the rewatch, the re-breakdown to Adam Wingard's 2021 Godzilla vs. Kong. This movie was a weird one because it came out during the pandemic and I remember watching it directly on HBO. I was going crazy, the movie was crazy, and I needed that chaos in my life. Next week, we'll be breaking down Godzilla x Kong, the new empire, and answering why Godzilla sleeps like a cat. Huge major thanks to Noah Chen, my best friend, my biggest man. I love you more than anything. He helped me write this breakdown. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Lulu underscore Clemens. Subscribe to all our channels in the new Rockstars Network for all that deep analysis that you little monarchs can't get enough of. And always remember, no one can keep the reins on Kong.